Good morning, Liberty. We are live. It is Friday morning, February the 8th, 2019. My name is Michael Bolden, 9.30 a.m. Pacific time here on the West Coast from my downtown Los Angeles home office and studio for the 10th Amendment Center. Thank you so much for joining me today. I appreciate you spending a little time with me this morning or this afternoon or this evening, whenever you happen to be tuning in, whether it's live or in the archives. Today, I want to talk a little bit about surveillance, um, kind of a niche in the surveillance kind of apparatus. As we uncover piece by piece all the various parts of the of the surveillance state, from NSA spying to license plate readers to stingray devices and on and on, I think this is an important piece of the puzzle, and that is fusion centers. Fusion centers, they're really the kind of the local federal hub of how data is transferred. I keep referring back to the episode 2.5 billion, talking about the license plate readers and how they're collected on a state or a local level and then shared everywhere. And the example is often uh, that I mention is, okay, so you drive through an intersection that has a red light camera with a license plate reader in Boise, Idaho, and then law enforcement in Honolulu, Hawaii, or the Drug Enforcement Agency in uh, in Washington, D.C., which shouldn't exist as a side note, uh, they all know they have a pattern of your travel, uh, and as they expand the facial recognition to this as well, they know who your passengers are. And the, the hubs that really do the data sharing, I think there's around 19 or so of them around the country. No, there's 70 of them, actually, uh, are these fusion centers. So I want to talk a little bit about that. I also want to mention that earlier this week, it was the anniversary of the birthday of James Otis Jr. So if we're talking about surveillance, this is the guy. I mean, back in the pre-revolutionary days, he was really what some people call the founding father of the Fourth Amendment. He was uh, really, he gained his fame amongst his contemporaries and his friends like Samuel Adams and John Hancock. He was really one of the greats, but he's kind of a forgotten guy because he got beat up pretty bad uh, by the British for opposing opposing them before the war started. And it, I think it screwed up with his head, and he went a little crazy and died pretty early. But that's a sad story. But I want to talk a little bit about him, and then also kind of a, an overview of how these these fusion centers work and how they connect. And if we have some time, I don't want to go too long on a Friday, uh, talking about suspicious activity reporting, SARS, which are very popular. <laughs> I mean, they're more well-known here in Los Angeles. Uh, it's one of the cities, the major cities, that use suspicious activity recording. It's pre-crime. So if you ever watched Minority Report or any of these sci-fi films, this is them putting it into practice. But before doing that, I do want to say hi to all my great friends out in the live chat here on YouTube. Uh, Lazy Viewer, Larry Clark, EHP Training, Woodsider, Denver Libertarian. Good morning to all of you. Good afternoon, uh, especially to people like Lazy Viewer. And of course, a good reminder uh, from Woodsider. If you do like the show, you're interested in it, Please smash the like button, continue leaving some comments, share the link with your friends and family, whatever platform you happen to be watching or listening on. Uh, also, hi to existence as well. So whatever platform you have to be happen to be participating in this show, make sure to continue doing that. It really helps trigger the algorithms on those platforms and tells them to share it with more people. So I really appreciate that. I've started to see some reviews coming in over at iTunes as well, and that is actually really cool because at first, when I first started doing this, for those of you who've been with me since the beginning, early last summer in 2018, well, I guess it was like July of 2018, I had just gotten back from doing a speech in New Orleans for the Libertarian Party Mises Caucus. Scott Horton was there, Tom Woods, Walter Block, Bob Murphy, a bunch of people. And I decided I wanted to finally start doing this because we've got this nice channel here on YouTube that I've kind of uh, left a little bit behind. And at first I was only going to do video, but then I started getting people writing in saying, you know, I like watching, but I'm having to put the phone down or I'm having to find ways to listen to it at work and I don't want to have the video going. So can you do it as a podcast? So eventually I decided to add it as a podcast. We're now on iTunes, Google, Spotify, and I also just recently submitted to TuneIn Pandora, which is unlikely to accept us. Uh, and Stitcher. I think we're also on Stitcher, too, so I added a link to that as well. But anyways, let's get into the, the topics that I want to cover for today. First of all, uh, 
Oh, and I also want to mention, I apologize for not having a show on Wednesday. That was kind of last minute. We had tons of construction this, that morning, and it was actually nice to get a little little time off. So I appreciate you guys being cool with me. And those of you who filled out my short survey they, that I sent out on uh, our YouTube community updates. So first of all, let's talk about James Otis, the founding father of the Fourth Amendment. This article from Gary M. Gallus. He's a professor of economics. He's an Austrian over at Pepperdine University in Malibu here in Southern California. Really good guy. I don't know him personally, but we've republished many of his articles over over the years. He writes for Mises.org and Fee, Fee.org, uh, Foundation for Economic Education. This was a repost from Fee. And he points out that February 5th marks the birth of the American who had the greatest hand in what became the Fourth Amendment's prohibition of unreasonable searches and seizures, James Otis. And he applied the celebrated English maxim, quote, every man's house is his castle. Basically, this is your home. You are the king of your home. And they can't come in there, really, unless they have a really, really good reason. The short version is a warrant based on probable cause describing the person's places or things to be searched or seized. And so this goes over a number of interesting kind of... uh, uh, history of his. And I'm not going to really get into too many of the details of it. I highlighted some sections that if you're watching that I think are just kind of an interesting story behind him. And this is the quote. He says, a man's house is his castle, and whilst he is qu- quiet, he is as well guarded as a prince in his castle. This writ, the writ, writs of assistance, would totally annihilate this privilege. Custom house officers may enter our houses when they please, break everything in their way, and whether they break through malice or revenge, no man, no court may inquire. In other words, they wanted to use general warrants. This was what real, one of the main causes of the revolution, the secession from Great Britain. Britain was the power of government to basically search through whatever they wanted, whenever they wanted, without notice, without warning, without you even having any type of suspicions of being under, uh, under criminal investigation. And that's how they apply it today, whether it's through NSA spying or through mass warrantless surveillance tools like license plate readers or Stingray devices or drones or facial recognition, all of these different things. Thermal in- imaging that takes on concealed carry. I did an episode on that a little while ago as well. So all of these are general warrants. They are basically like the writs of assistance that the founders actually opposed vehemently and led to breaking with the mother country. And now they're becoming norm. They're the norm, really. And in fact, they're far worse than what they were at the time because you'd have to have manpower to go in. Now it's based on algorithms. And uh, the suspicious activity reporting, I think, is even more frightening when it comes to that. So with that, of course, all the show notes I've posted here on YouTube, but we also put all the show notes and all of our archives over on our our website over at 10thamendmentcenter.com slash goodmorningliberty. I do encourage you to read this particular article. I think it's just interesting. It's a nice overview and introduction uh, to uh, Otis's life and his opposition to mass surveillance. So let's get into this other article from Joe Wolverton. He's a personal friend of mine. He writes for the New American Magazine, which is run by JBS. And we've been reposting, posting a lot of his articles for a long time, probably seven, eight years. Not all of them. He writes a lot more uh, than what we would ever cover. But he t- had a, a post just at the end of last month that we republished last week. Details of Fusion Center Surveillance Revealed. And I don't know if it's maybe the title is a little overstated. But what I think is interesting, and Joe actually points out, is that fusion centers are almost never talked about. People who work in them, operate them, partner with them, they just never bring it up. It's almost like a conspiracy theory. I remember a few years ago, there uh, was—the first time it actually made some news was a fusion center in Missouri, and I can't remember the details of it, where basically— spying and targeting people who were supporting the Ron Paul campaign for president. Maybe it was the 2008 campaign. I'm not sure. Maybe it was 2012. But it was a fusion center operation to basically monitor their suspicious activity for basically opposing the empire. So in Joe's article, he points out, typically we only get occasional glimpses of the despotic disregard for the Constitution and egregious violations of the rights of the people committed by DHS fusion centers. Now, the DHS, I don't think, should exist either, and therefore neither should their fusion centers. Thanks to a presentation, though, delivered by a sheriff's department, Joe writes, a sheriff's department sergeant at a casino in West Virginia— 
The scope of the surveillance and the blurring of the lines between federal, state, and local law enforcement were revealed without the typical reserve shown at similar gatherings. I don't really ever hear them talking about these. And I think it's it's very important to actually highlight this. So I'm very grateful that Joe wrote about this as well. So there was a, a report in the local newspaper that maybe someone brought to his attention. Hey, wow, man, these fusion centers, here's here's a government official actually talking about them at a conference. And the story in there, I wish he would have linked to it, but maybe maybe he has his reasons. Maybe he doesn't want to send them the traffic. But the sheriff was basically talking about how it works. And this is what it says. The center's mission is to anticipate, identify, prevent, monitor criminal activity, and all other hazards. You're supposed to anticipate. I think that's where it gets a little sci-fi. I mean, they're telling us their goal is to know when crime is going to happen in advance. And I don't know if I'm on board with that. I mean, I know I am not. I know some people would be. But I'm not on board with them trying to guess or figure out when crime is going to happen. Pre-crime sounds very dangerous. Because if we're thinking about liberty, individual liberty, someone may exhibit patterns of bad behavior. But if they don't actually commit the crime, they shouldn't have their liberty abridged in any way. Now, the TSA, and I've only mentioned this briefly. I really should actually do a show on it in the future. Add to my long list of I'm going to do a show on this in the future. But the TSA, for a while now, has been using SAR reports, suspicious activity reporting, basically saying if you have certain behaviors while waiting in line at the airport, you look nervous, you're agitated, you talk too much, maybe you sweat, you look fidgety, whatever, then you go on some kind of secondary watch list. And if you do this and they somehow determine, maybe they're looking at your posting history on social media, I'm not sure— but you could get flagged to have a stalker, a federal agent, buy tickets or get tickets for future flights and then get on those flights and follow you around. So this is suspicious activity reporting at its finest or worst. So this guy, Sell, he says, Sergeant Robert Sell, the bottom line, he said during his talk, is that the Fusion Center reaches out to many different levels within the community to gather information, process, analyze, predict, and ultimately issue warnings or alerts as appropriate. So the Fusion Center is basically taking the position that it's their goal to figure out when crime is going to happen. And then issue warnings, and then the local or the, the jurisdictional law enforcement or maybe a task force, maybe a ju- multi-jurisdictional task force, is going to basically beef up support at that area. I'm not sure if they're going to take action in advance or not, but it certainly leads to a situation where that can happen. And I think it's, uh, it's, it's really dangerous. Anna Ray says, yeah, minority report. I agree. It's really just like that in practice. I, you know, and, and that film— you know, they actually took action on it. They said, okay, well, the algorithms are so good that we know that this person's going to commit a crime and therefore we're going to go get them in advance. Well, <laughs> I mean, there, we're not at that point, but it, the, the foundation for that is being set up, and I'll get to that. Hopefully, you know, I should just make time for the suspicious activity reporting piece. It's really interesting. And Cell says this, quote, you may be surprised at the range of topics that are researched at the Fusion Center. You may be surprised, he says. They include terrorism, both international and domestic, gangs, security threat groups, auto theft, high technology crime, threats to public order, special events, and civil emergencies. I mean, I like how they kind of sneak stuff. I, you know, I don't want to be that conspiracy guy. But they, they say it so casually, like, okay, terrorism, threats to the public order, special events. Well, what's a special event? Is a special event a gathering? Is it a, a festival? Is it a music conference? Is it a protest? I mean, they just throw that in there amongst all these other— This is basically what the Southern po- Poverty Law Center did with me personally. Uh, they included all these crazy racist Nazis and things like that, and then they said, well, there's this guy too. They included me on the same list. And it's, it's basically the guilt by association type thing. If we include you in this group, well, then you're dangerous. 
threats to government, law enforcement, critical infrastructure, identity threat, theft and fraud, major serial arson, major alcohol, tobacco, and explosive incidents? Why would a tobacco issue be a concern for pre-crime or predicting crime, hazmat incidents, and any international incidents with potential local impact? Brad Krause, or is it Krause? Either way, I appreciate you mentioning this, says weaponized ambiguity. And that is a great way of putting it. I never thought of it that way. Because you have these terms that we don't really know what they mean. Special events is extremely broad. Could a wedding in a park be a, a, a special event? Certainly. Any public gathering, an auto show is a special event. A few months back, uh, there was a, a group of car clubs here that came from East L.A. and came into my neighborhood in downtown, which is on the cusp. And, you know, they did basically an unlicensed, unprepared parade. It was for a death of someone in their community. And like all these roads were blocked, it was cool to see all these old cars, but that certainly was a special event. Were these all criminals? Should they have been stopped? Certainly not. I don't know. Maybe the Fusion Center thought they were all dangerous. Frank I or Frank L says the end goal is full spectrum dominance. And I think that's a good way to put it as well. And then he also points out, this of course comes from 9-11, from the Patriot Act and from information sharing environment, which I've mentioned previously. He says the 9-11 Commission report outlined many deficiencies in the intelligence community. Of course, it never is good enough, as well as the lack of communication and information sharing both within and across government organizations, technology problems, blah, 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 and the need for a unified process for reporting, tracking, and accessing suspicious activity reports, SARs, to name a few. They're really big on this reporting. See something, say something is what we kind of know as the more popular thing. But he says, SARS can now be submitted by anyone. There's even an app for submitting. I haven't seen it. I won't install the thing if I do, but I'm interested. Maybe maybe on YouTube, someone has got a video about SAR apps or the suspicious activity reporting. <laughs> Here's how Wolverton puts it. It's awesome. Want to be rewarded for spying on your neighbor's citizen? Good news. There's an app for that. And he also talks about how in 2012, so uh, Patriot Act stuff went through and then it expanded. It's been slowly expanding over time. A special white paper, he says, was submitted to the House of Representatives where the DHS was encouraged to embark on an evolving mission away from its ostensible purpose of fighting terrorism toward becoming the administrator of enormous domestic intelligence agency resulting from an integration of the country's local and state law enforcement agencies. Now, they won't tell you that police are a national police force, but this gets it as close as possible in practice, even if not in name. So your local police, if they're participating in a nationwide network of policing, They really aren't local police making their own decisions based on their own information. They're participating in a big way. And in fact, and and I mentioned on a previous show recently, I've watched this kind of uh, this uh, this mini series on Netflix about Ted Bundy, which I thought was really well done. Really interesting show. But the overarching message that kept kind of just jabbing me, it felt like it made my hair stand on end a little bit, was they kept talking about how there wasn't enough data sharing. And that was the overarching message. They have to have more data sharing. And they talked about facial recognition and things like that. And I know what they're getting at. I think it's all propaganda to keep pushing these types of tools. Joe says, as the threat grows more localized, the federal government's need to train and even staff local agencies such as major major city police departments will grow. Put another way, Joe writes, the federal government will run your local police department and sheriff's office. And if they aren't already... They really will get that way. I mean, when you talk about asset forfeiture funding, uh, DHS and JAG grants to buy and get all this surveillance equipment to enforcing federal prohibition on things like guns or weed, the feds are really pushing the agenda and the locals are willing participants. Now, you're not going to stop this by attacking it at the federal level. It's definitely going to be something that has to... uh, be addressed at a local level. And Joe writes, or he covers this a little bit further. This is from the DHS website. Quote, a fusion center is a collaborative effort between or of two or more agencies 
that provide resources, expertise, and information to the center with the goal of mac- maximizing their ability to detect, prevent, investigate, and respond to criminal and terrorist activity. Now, I think most people like the idea of law enforcement agencies being able to communicate with each other to detect or investigate or respond to criminal and terrorist activity. Now, the federal government should not have anything to do with local crimes. This is These are state and local issues. There are only three crimes in the Constitution, and like most of them, the feds should not be involved. They've got enough stuff to do already if they just follow the Constitution. So... But the, the crazy part then, so I don't even want them involved in dealing with criminal activity. But I get how this sells it to most people because, of course, people, oh, yeah, of course, we want to stop crimes. We want to protect people. And they really are under the belief that these agencies are there to protect us instead of working to monitor us and determine who might be a threat to their agenda and prevent their activities going forward. So this is a great article by Joe Wolverton. It's a really interesting overview of some kind of just basically an insider view of someone actually talking about this and how they connect uh, the and as Joe writes, the the connection between local, state and federal all blurring, blurring the line and becoming one agency. So, of course, that's over in the show notes. I've got it posted on YouTube and that will also be over at 10th Amendment Center dot com slash Good Morning Liberty. The next piece that I want to cover here just to clear it out, is from uh, the Electronic Frontier Foundation. They're great on surveillance, and this is an important part of that. And they say this is basically an overview, an FAQ. And I, you know, I'm not going to go through much of this. This is something that even if you're the type of person that really just prefers to watch video or uh, listen to audio podcasts, if you want to spend some time reading stuff, this is a great kind of FAQ section. For those of you watching, there's all these questions about fusion centers specifically, and it gives you all the details, not in heavy details, but there's lots of links that you can go through and learn more. But if you really want to understand what they are, how they work, this is the place to go. And again, that is linked in the show notes. So EFF, the, the, the page is Why Fusion Centers Matter, FAQ. And they talk about how NSA surveillance is front and center. But they point out fusion centers are a local arm of the so-called intelligence community. I consider it the surveillance state. And this is where I got the number 17 wrong earlier. The 17 agencies coordinated by the National Counterterrorism Center, NCTC. The government document, documentation around fusion centers is entirely focused on breaking down barriers between the various government agencies that collect and maintain criminal intelligence information. It's the same information that we get from our, from friends at EFF, which is primarily um, anti-surveillance state progressives that work in, in that organization, and for, as we get from our JBS friend, Joe Wolverton. So that should tell you something. When you've got people on So far ends of the spectrum, not the mainstream right and left, but those far ends of the spectrum, at least how we're presented that spectrum, telling us the same thing. So they say this story demonstrates what we called one of the biggest dangers of the surveillance state, the unquenchable thirst for access to the NSA's trove of information by other law enforcement agencies. And they're talking about how fusion centers also serve as a conduit going from information sharing from the NSA down to locals. I generally refer to fusion centers as sharing the data upstream and all around. So you collect a license plate scan in Honolulu or in Los Angeles, and everybody's got it. You use a Stingray device to monitor everybody. You use thermal imaging to see who's got concealed carry. This all gets into databases through the fusion centers. But it's also the other way around. The NSA is spying on everybody, and they're doing something called parallel construction. So if the NSA is collecting information that's without a warrant, and in a lot of courts, that's not even legal to you. So what the NSA does is they tell, through the fusion centers, they tell local law enforcement to do something called parallel construction. They give them the information in advance, and then they have to recreate come up with different ways to get the evidence that they already have so they can present a fake trail, paper trail, that they got it legally. And uh, 
William Binney, who's a former technical director of the NSA, he called this was the, the most dangerous threat to the republic, I think, since the Civil War. They also talk about that a little bit here in this EFF highlight, the FAQ page. So in the way they put it, fusion centers and even local law enforcement could, could potentially be receiving unminimized NSA data. And EFF is very cautious about how they put this. They don't really, they don't add a lot of hype. I'm going to say they are absolutely receiving. The NSA is not collecting this just to have it all stored in, in Utah. They're collecting it because they want to use it. And we can't trust them. EFF points out, this runs counter to the distant image many people have of the NSA, and it's why focusing on fusion centers as part of the recently invigorated conversation around surveillance is important. And they've got all these questions. What are there? There are 78 recognized fusion centers listed on the DHS website. I wonder if they still have that page up. Oh, yeah, you can just click in. If you click through the link... How many are there, it says. How, there are 78 recognized. If you click through the DHS website, you can actually go through. So if I'm clicking on California, Los Angeles Joint Regional Intelligence Center, it's a recognized one. They have recognized and unrecognized. It's really interesting. Primary in Arkansas. I saw Bob Brewer there in the chat. Let's see what we got down in Texas. Texas, it looks like, has one, two, three, four, five, six. So I'm not sure if they're updating this these days, but uh, there's a lot of these. And then EFF starts getting into a little bit about su suspicious activity reporting. The idea that anybody who seems to be suspicious doing weird stuff, very Soviet, get your app, report on the suspicious activity to whoever is on the other end of that app, that gets fed into the uh, to the fusion center, and then the fusion center par partners with a company that provides an algorithm to actually predict where crime may happen. And EFF includes a short piece. What is suspicious activity reporting? The government defines SAR as official documentation of observed behavior reasonably indicative of pre-operational planning related to crim terrorism or other criminal activity. SARS can be initiated by law. Well, think about it. Uh, carrying concealed without a government permi permission in many places is a criminal act. Growing a plant in your backyard is a criminal act, even in places, states where it's legal. It's a criminal act to the federal government. There's so many things that are criminal acts. I think there's a book that talks about how many crimes that the average person commits per year or per day, and it's a lot because we don't even know. So they go on and say SARS can be initiated by law enforcement, by private sector partners, or by see something, say something tip from citizens. They are then investigated by law enforcement. And the last piece of this puzzle is I want to talk about this suspicious activity reporting. I first heard about it. I've mentioned many times uh, my friend Hamid Khan, who runs Stop LAPD, Stop LAPD Spying Coalition. A few years ago, he was talking about SARS being run by LAPD. They were primarily targeting communities of color. And that was his that was his issue there. You're using these to target these communities. And I thought it was a little crazy town. I'm like, okay, maybe it's like a pilot program in LAPD. They're kind of a, like a military force anyways. Uh, but now we're learning that they're spreading all over the place. I should have been on top of this a few years ago, and I really wasn't. But I'm seeing it all over the place as I look. This just came out, I think, this week in Motherboard Advice. Dozens of cities have secretly experimented with predictive policing software. It's a company called Predpol. It's a predictive policing software that once advocated for a controversial, unproven, broken windows approach to law enforcement. I wonder if people reading this, and I know the, the readership over Advice and EFF, ACLU, and many others that are in that realm, they aren't. They aren't free market types generally, but maybe the idea of broken window, maybe they can start, that'll open their eyes or their ears to hearing that about economic theory as well, as a side note. I doubt it, but maybe. So PredPol claims to use an algorithm to predict crime in specific 500 by 500 foot sections of a city so police can patrol or surveil specific areas more heavily. 
gives a list of areas that they were being used. Uh, Police departments of South Jordan, Utah, Mountain View, California by Google, of course. Atlanta, Haverhill, Palo Alto, Modesto, Merced, California, Livermore, mostly in California, Tacoma, University of California, Berkeley. This was all found using public records requests. We know that Los Angeles has been using this. It was called uh, Police Directive 1 or something from uh, Stop LAPD Spying. But they've been using it aggressively here. Oh, here it is. They actually included this. Previous reports state that California cities, Los Angeles, Elgin, Oakland, Richmond, and Milpitas, which collectively have a population of almost 5 million, all used PredPulse software at one point. I'm sure LAPD is using, if they're not using this one, they've got another one. The most recent available documents obtained by Motherboard show that Modesto, Merced, and Cal Berkeley still have contracts with the company. Livermore does not plan to renew its contract, which ends this month, according to these documents. Now, I wouldn't be surprised if there's not another company. I know I've often talked about Stingray surveillance. These are these cell site simulator devices. Stingray is just a brand name from the Harris Corporation. And for, for a few years, those of us in this kind of fight, this struggle, for privacy against the surveillance state, we would only call them stingrays. And I still do that. And I think that can be dangerous because, oh, you might hear about someone, we're not going to get stingrays anymore. But then they just get it from another company and they're still doing the same thing. So even if they're not using PredPol, I wouldn't be surprised if they're using something else. And they, they're basically predicting crime in an area through an algorithm. Will that algorithm tie in with your social media, with your ancestry and Ancestry.com or 23andMe profile? I think over time, it is not unlikely that that could happen. Now, they quote, uh, actually, a good friend of mine, Shahid Buttar, who now he used to run an organization called the Bill of Rights Defense Committee. We worked with him very closely. He's a Green Party guy, uh, but we worked with him very closely at BORDC. They're still around, but he's not the head guy there, uh, against NDAA indefinite detention. So we work with them very closely. He's also very good on the surveillance issue, and he works now with EFF up in San Francisco. And he puts it this way. Think about this. If you over-police certain communities and only detect crime within those communities and then try to provide a heat map of predictions, any AI will predict that crimes will occur in the places that they've happened before. So... (laughs) It just, to me, it's common sense. Like, wherever they're applying this, it's going to predict or maybe get some right from time to time, and eventually it's going to just keep putting resources there. Brad Krause says, a trauma-informed geo-targeting political uh, prisoner too. over 20 million felons in America, according to USA Dead Clock. I didn't know that they actually tracked that as well. That's really interesting. And if you think about, if you're already a felon for some nonviolent crime, which you shouldn't have on your record in the first place. It's absurd. Then you're in this algorithm and you're more likely to commit another crime. Frank says 10 years from now, you want to run for office? Absolutely. (laughs) They will access the info from the Fusion Center, like the recent blackface scandal. Sherry uh, makes comment about uh, Joe Wolverton, etc. I think it's just very interesting. Trauma informed is the actual term, says Brad. Okay, I appreciate that. Thank you. If you've got, I'll actually just have to Google that. Trauma informed. I'm not actually familiar with that, and I want to learn a little bit more about this. And I think Frank says Stasi gone wild is uh, is really interesting. Sherry says well worth hitting Joe Wolverton's website. I agree. Follow him on Twitter as well, Instagram. He does a lot of posts. Really good research. He's got a book on Madison. Uh, that I think everyone should check out as well, too. So this whole idea of information sharing and then going into crazy town, I guess what they would call us, of predictive policing, anticipating when and where criminal activity could be. And then let's say, let's say they had 100% accuracy in predicting crime. I mean, it's not possible, but let's say And then they went out and arrested people based on that. There's still a problem here. Because what's considered criminal activity is the problem then. So uh, I mentioned like having a gun without a permission slip or a plant or whatever. Raw milk, for example, is a crime in many places. To sell raw milk or consume it is, is illegal. And so as they keep adding peaceful activity 
to the list of criminal activities, then over time, even the best predictive policing model, the perfect one, is a dangerous one. So I hope you guys found this interesting. It is uh, it's frightening in many ways. It's very insightful. There's a lot of resources to go through. I do encourage you, if you're not on YouTube, if you're either uh, listening to the podcast or watching the archives on another platform, go over to 10thamendmentcenter.com slash goodmorningliberty, and you can go through these links. Joe Wolverton's article is very good. Uh, the, uh, the FAQ section on fusion centers from the EFF and, of course, the report from Motherboard with the interview with Shahid Buttar is also very good. So please do some reading on this. I'm only basically scratching the surface. And so I hope you guys find this interesting enough where you can go a little bit further. Next week, I'm going to do a couple of different shows. Eh, I don't want to make any promises. One I definitely want to cover, and uh, you know, you guys who had filled out my little mini survey on YouTube, I appreciate the ideas. I definitely want to talk a little bit more about the Federal Reserve. I'm not sure if I'm going to do this next week, but I also want to talk about uh, a, a story about how one state actually turned off resources to a federal agency and then won. So I want to talk about that. And then I think we really need to cover, when I first started doing the show, I did a lot on foreign policy news. I think at some point I definitely need to start covering that a little bit more as well. And if you guys have any other ideas, I've gotten a lot of emails and feedback on this, please send them over to team at 10thamendmentcenter.com. I do want to clarify, I'm not promising I'm going to do all those shows next week, but these are ones that I've got on on my mind to actually cover. So please feel free to leave some comments of things you'd like me to cover uh, or email team at 10thamendmentcenter.com. I appreciate all the feedback, even if I don't uh, get into it. And of course, thank you guys all for watching. I see Bobby Hilliard. Thank you. This is glad you're doing this. Uh, Bob Brewer, Larry Clark, Sherry Brad, Lazy Viewer, EHP Training, Existence. I think Woodsider was up there. Anna and everybody else, Ward Lawrence. I appreciate you guys all spending some time with me today. I really appreciate you smashing the like button, all the comments, sharing the link. Uh, to this show, whatever platform, with your friends and family. And I hope you have a wonderful weekend. I'll be back next week, back to normal schedule, Monday, Wednesday, Friday at 9.30 a.m. Pacific time. And I hope you have a wonderful weekend. Thanks again for watching.